Hey, somebody brought a bunch of Magnum bars. So if you did not get yours, well, you may be out of luck by the time class is over. Because some people are grazing through the kitchen already. All right, things to pray for. Uh, Jeff Phipps will be leaving in about a week, I think it's next Wednesday, for Brazil, and will be there until the 15th, teaching in three different cities, so pray for him, pray for receptive ears, and that they'll have a great opportunity uh, to continue to expand that ministry in Brazil. Also, we'll be having guest speakers, Dr. Douglas Petrovich, next Tuesday, Thursday, and the next Tuesday and Thursday, and I know that you will uh, appreciate him uh, because of his wide area of, of expertise. So uh, I know everybody will look, look, be looking forward to that. And the other thing is there's an election next Tuesday. And um, for those of you who are living in Houston and may be a little bit uh, undecided as to whom, whom you should vote for, as to for whom you should vote. Uh, talk to Cheryl, and she will give you, send you an email. Uh, there was an email that came out from Dave Welch. All of this is just personal opinion, of course, uh, that uh, gave his view. He's the director of the Houston Area Pastors Council. They've spent a lot of time interviewing all of the candidates, all the people. They had uh, one debate that I had a conflict with and couldn't make. And so they've got some, some good information. And there's a good slate of people running for almost every one of the at-large positions. There's at least one strong believer. There's one in the fourth position, I believe, who is also a teacher at uh, College of Biblical Studies. There's the, in position two, the wife of a pat conservative pastor who's been a member of the Houston Area Pastors Council. And there's a couple of other, and there, there's a, uh, in, no, that's position three. Position, I think there's five positions. Position two is a pastor, black pastor, who's one of the founding members of the Houston Area Pastors Council. For those of you who don't know, that is a conservative group of pastors who was, which was formed about 20 years ago because 99.9% .9 of the time when the media goes to find out what pastors think, they go to the most liberal, uh, false teachers that they can find in the vicinity and get their opinion. And so this way there is a group of conservative Bible-believing pastors that give their viewpoint. They've been quite effective in a number of things, so you need to continue to pray for them because they are uh, constantly under, under assault. So they've done a good job, uh, consistent with some of the other con conservative things that I've seen, but not all conservative things that come in your mail are conservative. Just remember that. Just like not all Israel is Israel. Not all conservative flyers with voting recommendations are truly conservative. So you have to do your homework. All of these are just suggestions from different people, but that gives you a pretty good idea. It's quite helpful for me, as a matter of fact. So. We come together tonight to focus on the Word, and so we need to make sure we are, we are spiritually prepared. Scripture says, How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, which will give everyone the opportunity to make sure that they are in right relationship with the Lord, uh, abiding in Christ, walking by the Spirit, walking in the light, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we have sinned, then we need to Admit or acknowledge those sins in silent prayer to the Lord, and he will instantly cleanse us, forgive us, and restore us to that intimate walk with him. Let's pray.
Our Father, we thank you for the clarity with which you reveal yourself in Scripture, for the fact that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, that we are indeed a temple, a place for the Trinity to dwell within us, that we might have an intimate walk of dependency upon you. We're thankful that we have a Savior who has paid the penalty for sin, so that the issue is not our sin, the issue is not our remorse, our guilt, our sorrow. The issue is simply reminding you of the fact, as it were, that Christ has paid the penalty for these sins. And when we admit them, acknowledge them to you, then because they have been paid for, we are instantly cleansed and forgiven of all sin. Thank you for the spiritual life that you have given us that is due based upon this ministry of God the Holy Spirit in our life. We pray that you would continue to teach us about this, that we may come to understand it better and better. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're in a very important passage in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9, and it is a setup for what is depicted here in our opening graphic, and that is the warning that comes in the second chapter about false teachers. One of the most important ways in which we build a defense in our souls against false teachers is to know the word more than anything else. Now, some of you have been around long enough to remember that back about 50 or 60 years ago, it was a common illustration that you really didn't need to take time to study the x-acts and spasms of within the church or the hostile false religions outside the church. All you really needed was to know the truth. And if you knew the truth, then that would give you the discernment. There's a little problem with that. There's a lot of subtlety in the errors that are out there. Satan has had thousands of years to craft his counterfeits. And the illustration that was often used back in the 50s and 60s was what you will remember that when the way the story went, the way they would train the FBI to be able to spot a counterfeiter, a counterfeit, was to have them spend a lot of time with the genuine article so that they were so familiar with all of the minute details in a 20 a 50 $100 bill, those are the, the most common bills counterfeited, that they could easily spot a counterfeit. But technology came along. And we have tools that counterfeit dollars today that unless you have microscopes and unless you have all kinds of uh, lighting and all kinds of other uh, tools of analysis, it will easily fool you. And, and just because you're familiar with the genuine article doesn't mean that you can just look or feel a, a counterfeit bill and discern that it's a counterfeit. And I think that's an even better illustration because the tools that Satan has developed to deceive believers is more like what we have today than what we had 50 years ago because it looks so close and we get distracted by the personalities, we get distracted by the success, we get distracted by the 95% that is true and we swallow the 5% that is cyanide and it's destructive to our spiritual life. And Peter is going to point out the specifics of the false teaching. When I was growing up, sometimes that was frowned upon. You don't name names and you don't point out the specifics because if people are really growing, they'll spot that. And I've discovered experientially that people are sheep. That's not a compliment. That means they would go drink poison if it was put in front of them and they were thirsty, not being able to tell the difference between poison and water. It's amazing. Sheep will do that. And Christian sheep will do that because it takes a long time to truly become adept at spotting 
some of the things that are going on today, and they're just rampant today. It is so amazing how many counterfeit Bible teachers there are out there who have built uh, monuments to their sin, monuments to their false teaching, and they have 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, 20,000 people come to their auditoriums on Sunday morning, and everybody thinks they're godly because they always talk about loving Jesus, serving Jesus, doing what Jesus wants me to do. And I always, the first thing I, that comes to my mind is, which Jesus? Is this Jesus of Nazareth? Who is, and do you understand Christology from the Bible? Or is this Jesus, who's also a gardener, but he has the same name? And just because... Has this, he has the same name, doesn't mean he's the same person. You, you distinguish him by his characteristics. So we have to know those characteristics of truth. And so God has provided for us this, this tr- through his power, as we're reading in first or Second Peter 1, 3, that his power has given us everything pertaining to life and the spiritual life, so that it is through knowledge of him. Knowledge of God, that means we have to spend a maximum amount of time in his word, not just reading, not just letting our eyes go back and forth across the page, but truly thinking about what we're reading and what it implies and what it means. It takes time to develop maturity. It doesn't happen overnight, although the Apostle Paul assumed that the Corinthians would have reached a level of maturity within three years. So it's not like a lifetime. I remember hearing someone at at a former church saying, I don't think I'll ever reach spiritual maturity. And I just wanted to say, how long have you been a believer? 40 years? Well, Paul castigated the Corinthians because they hadn't become spiritually mature in three years. And spiritually mature doesn't mean you know everything or you are are you're perfect or you're sinless. It just means that you have grown beyond adolescence in the spiritual life. And that's available to every one of us. It's just a matter of what our, what our priorities are and what we're spending our time on. How much we're letting ourselves be sucked into the entertainment culture of our day rather than being entertained by the teaching of God's Word and by reading God's Word. And so we, we fritter away this incredible resource of time that God has given us. But we have been given these things at the instant of salvation, but they are developed through learning, through study, through expanding our understanding and comprehension of God, through the knowledge of God, and it uses the term epinosis, meaning a, a fuller knowledge, a more intimate knowledge about God, who is the one who called us by glory and virtue. We saw that represents his, his character. And so in those first three verses, five through our first verses uh, three and four, it emphasizes what God has given us. And then Peter says in verse five, which we covered last time, for this reason, For the reason that he has given us so much, for the reason that he has given us everything we need, we have the potential is there for every one of us. It's up to our volition how we exploit that uh, that potential, and so we are to supply by means of faith. So God gives us the potential, and then we looked at this term here from the verb that met that related to the choir, the Greek choir in, in Greek drama, and the choir master would supply all of their needs, their, give them financial aid, supply whatever resources they needed. That's the idea, that we are to supply by means of our faith, this is our responsibility, God's given us everything, but we supply by our faith these virtues, these graces, these spiritual qualities and characteristics And they're listed there, seven of them, in verses 5 through 7. And then in verse 8, we have an explanation of the significance of this, and that's indicated by the fact that both verse 8 
and verse 9 start with the word for, indicating it's explaining or giving the reason for the previous sentence. That's verses 5 through 7. So we have the positive in verse 8, if these things are ours, and they are. If they're ours, then we are. That shouldn't be a perfect tense, I mean, a future tense. It is a present in the scripture, but it has this implication of what will develop. You are neither barren. If you have these things, they're yours and you're developing, then you are not barren, neither are you unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the, that relates to the application of our knowledge of Jesus Christ. That, um, you know, when we come together and we learn the word, first of all, it's just gnosis. It's just knowledge. It's information. When we believe it, God the Holy Spirit stores it in our soul. But believing it isn't just a simple act of saying, oh, I believe that. Robbie made good sense. I believe that. Well, did you understand it? Well, I've got to listen to that tape three or four more times before I really understand it. Well, you can't believe something you don't understand unless you're just an airhead mystic. You have to understand it. And sometimes I'm not sure I really understand it. I know it at one level, but I constantly grow. And that's what we see going on in this passage is that these we are to pursue with all diligence the development of these characteristics, these qualities. So it's an ongoing lifetime of the pursuit of, of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. So the one who exploits it is not barren. He's not unfruitful. On the other hand, the one who does not, who just sits and soaks it up and doesn't apply what he's learned, multiple stages. We hear the word, we have to choose whether or not we believe what's been taught, what the scripture says. Then, God the Holy Spirit is going to enhance that, store it in our soul, and it becomes epinosis. But that doesn't do you any good. A lot of people get the idea, well, when, once it becomes epinosis, then, you know, I'm there. Wrong. You have to apply the epinosis. That's another act of volition. And a lot of Christians have, uh, whether it's a Bible doctrine notebook on the shelf or Bible doctrine notebook in their head, unless they're applying it when they get in different situations in life, then it still doesn't do you any good. It's just, uh, it's just there, but it's not producing fruit. It's not producing anything. And those who don't do anything with it other than fill up notebooks, and they have a lot of information, uh, they're short-sighted, they're blind, and they have really become ungrateful in their soul, forgotten the significance of the fact that they have been cleansed from all sin. So, verse 5, we read, for this reason we are to the New King James says, give all diligence. And that is, it, first it talks about doing this by means of your faith. So that undergirds everything. So for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So faith is foundational. It's by means of your faith you add. So it's the faith rest drill undergirds everything. We talk about the 10 spiritual skills. Every one of them functions on the faith rest drill. That's why it's foundational. You have to understand the word, believe it, trust it, rely on it. Then Peter uses a literary device to develop these characteristics. So there's an order and structure to that literary device, but that doesn't mean that you develop these qualities one at a time. A lot of people get that idea on some things. Spiritual growth is very messy, just like everything else in life. You grow a little more uh, in one area than another area. Let's say you start coming to, uh, or you start listening to me online, and we're going through a study dealing with love. Well, that's fairly advanced. 
And you haven't heard anything much yet about confession of sin or the faith rest drill. So you're getting a lot of information on more advanced spiritual skills where you're going to grow in those areas at that time because that's the information you're getting. And then maybe a year later, you pick up some more studies, you focus a little more on the faith rest drill, and so you begin to develop there. And then a while later, you start studying in areas of endurance and perseverance that leads to hope. And so that's, again, a more mature skill, but you're starting to build it. It's it's dynamic. A little of this one, a little of that one, a little more of this one, back to the first one. We grow in all of these areas at different rates or different speeds. But the way it's presented for a dynamic teaching effect is called this sorite, and it, it shows this gradation. It's just a literary device to organize a series of characteristics or qualities building one on another literarily, not indicating an actual order of things. So I've translated this verse now, but also for this very reason, exert yourself with all diligence. You have to put forth effort to get up in the morning and come to church on Sunday, to be at Bible class, to take the time to listen online. It's got to be built in as a habit pattern. You have to be diligent, consistent, disciplined. And then add by means of your faith spiritual excellence, translated virtue usually, and virtue is usually defined as moral excellence, but there's a difference between moral excellence, morality, and spirituality. Believers can be moral when they're out of fellowship. Unbelievers can be moral when they're spiritually dead. So m- virtue in the, in the scripture is not talking about moral excellence. It is moral. But it's beyond that. It's something produced by God, the Holy Spirit, in our life as we walk by the Spirit. So the idea there of adding by means of your faith is this word, epikorigeo, which means to, it had something to do with the chorus back in 500 years earlier. But by the time of the New Testament, it just meant to supply, to furnish something to someone. And it, didn't, it had completely lost that idea of the chorus. So add, by means of your faith, spiritual excellence and to spiritual excellence, uh, knowledge. Knowledge is the foundation for all building in the scripture. That's why Peter ends this epistle, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To knowledge we add self-restraint, self-discipline, self-mastery. We say no to the desires of the flesh. And that takes time. It takes, it's three steps forward and two steps back sometimes, but that's how spiritual growth is. It's not clean, simple, automatic. There's no one-shot decision. There's no 100-shot decisions. It's a lifetime of developing patterns of of obedience. So it's self-restraint, to self-restraint endurance, which means to stick with it, don't give up, stay in there, hang in there, uh, don't reach a point in your spiritual life where you think, well, I've got all my questions answered, I know basically what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to go enjoy life a little bit. Whatever joy you get in this life from whatever pleasures there are, a lot of legitimate pleasures out there, hobbies, things to do, fun things to enjoy, it's nothing compared to the things we're going to do and enjoy and experience when we're in the millennial kingdom and we're in the eternal state. Uh, We can go do all kinds of hair-raising things and we can't do any bodily harm or injury to ourselves or anyone else. We can speed as fast as we want to and wreck the car and walk away from it. We can fall from 20 miles up and our resurrection bodies are not going to be harmed by that. So we can have the, all kinds of thrills later without putting ourselves in danger. So we have to stick with it now and remember the mission, which is to grow to spiritual maturity, not to enjoy every opportunity. People in previous centuries didn't have this problem. 
They didn't have all the leisure time. They didn't have all the luxury time. They didn't have all the opportunities to travel and to experience. And that's just a gr wonderful thing. I enjoy, to the extent that I can, all of the different opportunities to travel and go here and go there and do things. But it can never be at the expense of spiritual growth. So it's endurance. It's staying with it all the way to the end getting up off of our deathbed to go pray with somebody and then go back to the deathbed and die. That is the example from the Old Testament. We don't stop serving the Lord until he stops our heart. Up to that point, we keep serving the Lord. Uh, then to endurance, spiritual maturity, eusebia, which runs through several verses in Second Peter, to spiritual maturity, brotherly kindness, we're all members of the family of God, even if you may not care that much for someone else. And nevertheless, we treat them with kindness, not because they deserve it, but because God has loved them, and so we should love them as well. And then adding to that agape love, that is God's love. John 13, 34, this new commandment is the mark of the New Testament student of Jesus Christ. So, I decided I'd build a little chart, a little visual. The, 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 the ground floor, the foundation is faith. It is by means of faith that we add all these qualities. And then the penthouse is love. Now, we're developing love for one another all along the way. But that is the ultimate picture of the maturing believer. Now, regarding all of these different characteristics, spiritual excellence, knowledge, self-restraint, endurance, brotherly affection, and love, Peter then explains why this is important. This is not optional in our spiritual life. God isn't saying, well, for those of you who are high achievers and like to excel, I'm going to give you a little extra uh, bonus assignments. This is for everybody. This is for the underachiever, the low achiever, the I'm too lazy to achieve. This is to encourage everyone. If these things are yours, that is these qualities that he's just mentioned, if they're yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. People get all confused about what fruit is. Usually they think fruit is how many people they let, they've led to the Lord, how many Bible studies they've led, how, things like that. Fruit in the Scripture, in the New Testament especially, is mostly character transformation. That's fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of righteousness. It's character quality being transformed into the uh, image of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what is the, where the production takes place. The other things are mostly outside of our control, but as God gives us opportunities, we take advantage of them. So here it's specifically related to not being barren and not being unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll talk about that when we get there. And then the contrast for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, it's going back to just being spiritually blind like when you were spiritually dead, and this person has forgotten that he was cleansed from all his sins. So, 2 Peter 1, 8. This is kind of awkward to translate. Nearly every translation translates it with a, as a conditional sentence, which I think is accurate. There are few commentaries, even if they try to get granular, that deal with this, I think, appropriately enough. But it's a, you have two participles. The first participle is the word huparko, and the second part, uh, participle is the word pleonadzo. And these are words that indicate their, their adverbial participles, and one aspect of an adverbial participle is that it can be used as a, to express a condition, to express a condition. 
So you don't have your word if there, you just have a you just have a participle and it becomes clear from a person who would be a native speaker of that language that this is, uh, this is a conditional participle. He's saying, if they're yours. In verse 9, if they're not yours. So if these things are yours. And the idea in the first verb is reflected in the translation of, of the present tense uh, are yours. It's a present active participle, a conditional participle. It means to be or to exist, to have something or to possess something. So if you possess these things, if you possess these qualities, these characteristics, if they are part of your life, is what he is saying, and if they are in abundance, if they are increasing, because you don't just reach a point and stop. It, it continues to increase and to grow until you are exactly like Christ. Well, since that's not going to happen in this life, we never reach a point where we can plateau and just say, okay, that's it, I've arrived. We never arrive in, in this life. Now, that word pleonazo has the idea of increasing or abounding, multiplying. We get our English word pleonasm, which is a word that describes somebody who uses too many words to explain something. He has abounded in his verbiage. He has become loquacious, and he talks too much. So uh, it just simply refers to that which has be, you have abounded in this. It has grown and grown, and now you are neither barren nor unfruitful. And it translates that as you will be, but notice it's the word kathistemi, which means to cause someone to experience something. So if these things abound, then it, will ca then it causes us to experience fruitfulness. Now what's interesting is in, this is a present active indicative. This is a main verb in this sentence that you will be caused to experience uh, something that is neither barren nor unfruitful. That's a little awkward to translate that into English, so that's probably why they've translated that as a future tense. If you have these things and you will become, you will begin to experience a lack of barrenness and a lack of, um, lack of unfruitfulness. And it is, these two words are important words. The word for barren is the word on the right, argos, which means to be idle, not doing anything in your spiritual life. You're too busy to go to church. You've got to take the kids too many places. Then maybe their kids are doing too many things. You've got too many details of life that are more important than the word of God. You are idle. And that you are barren. You are idle, you're lazy spiritually, you're useless. It doesn't mean you're worthless. No Christian is worthless. We have worth and value in the sight of God, but we can be useless. We can't be used as God would like to use us, and we're unproductive. And then the second word is just the uh, negative of the word for fruitfulness, karpos, but you put the A in front of it. It's like the English prefix UN. It negates it, so it just means unfruitful. You're not bearing fruit. Now we have to talk a little bit about what it means to bear fruit, but we'll get there. That will be the most of the second half of the Bible class. So you, and it comes, as we're studying this, it comes in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, or by means of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I was looking for a page here that is Somewhat disappeared. Oh, here it is. Uh, it is uh, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that means that it is through that knowledge or toward the goal of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Literally, it's not in as in by means of the knowledge. It is toward the goal. Uh, it is a, the preposition ace. Uh, and that indicates the idea of the goal or the 
uh, production of or the application of that knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And then verse 9, again, picks up the same idea of an explanation with the beginning of 4, and says, for he who lacks these things. And literally, it's, uh, it's used with the negative, so it has that idea of the absence, one who does not have these character qualities. And they are said to be simply short-sighted. My mother had another phrase for it. She would say, you can't look beyond the end of your nose, can you? That's a less polite way of saying you have no sense of your eternal destiny. You can't think about how this is going to impact next week or next year or uh, a decade from now. You're just living for today or tomorrow. You're not living for uh, where you're going to be 20 or 30 years from now or where you're going to be in eternity. So the person who is short-sighted lacks a personal sense of their eternal destiny even to the point of being blind. The Greek word is just very clear there. It's, you can't see truth because you're walking in darkness. We're going to look at that in just a minute. You're either walking in darkness or you're walking in the light. And when we walk in the light, that means we're walking by means of the Holy Spirit. We're abiding in Christ. We're walking in our partnership of dependence. That's what fellowship means. Koinonia means partnership. So when we're in fellowship, what that means is we're walking, an active verb, we're doing something. It's not a passive state where we're just, okay, I confess my sin now, I'm just in fellowship. No, it has the idea of, of being in that partnership where we are walking in dependence upon God. And so that is necessary to produce fruit. And it's, it, it, the contrast is that if you're not doing that, you're walking in darkness, which means you're spiritually blind as if you were spiritually dead. And you've forgotten that you once were cleansed from all of your sins. And that's another very important uh, phrase. That, uh, and you are cleansed from your old sins, actually. It's the uh, Greek word it looks similar to the word for uh, all, but it's the word pale, which like the old man, you're cleansed from your old sins, that which was uh, there before the cross. You're cleansed at the cross positionally, and then afterward you confess sin and you are continually cleansed from those sins. Now we're going to look at some of these key passages. So that shows that this, this section from 5 through 9 is foundational for understanding the spiritual life, and it fits with the other key passages that we've studied in the past that emphasize these things. And I want to spend some time looking at what it means to bear fruit and what the conditions are for bearing fruit by going through some key passages. Now, we're going to look at one passage in John 15, which was written by the Apostle John. The Apostle John was a commercial fisherman. He was a partner of Peter's. John has his set of vocabulary. His vocabulary is very different from Paul's vocabulary. John talked and wrote probably like Jesus talked. It's very common for people to observe that if you're reading through John chapter 3, at some point after verse 16 or 17, uh, Jesus stops talking and John is writing. When does that happen? You go and you read through the Greek of the upper room discourse from John 13 through John 17, and then you go read 1 John, and it, it just reverberates with the language and the rhythms of Jesus in the upper room. Now, Jesus talked to his disciples in the upper room the night before he went to the cross in AD 33. John is writing 1 John somewhere around 90, 87 maybe, maybe 93, we don't know exactly. But he's writing some 60 years after Jesus spoke, and he still sounds like Jesus. Now, we've all heard people who sound like their mentors, and that's typical. Uh, I tell young pastors, listen to a couple of good Bible teachers and don't be afraid to 
borrow from them, they borrow it from somebody else. It's often remarked that the greatest plagiarizers on the planet are pastors. They hear some other pastor use a good turn of the phrase and they borrow it over and over again. So if it communicates, it communicates. That's the name of the game. It isn't who came up up with the idea or the illustration. It is what helps people to understand the word. No, none of us own any of this content. That's owned by God. We're just there to communicate it. So we need to look at this, this whole concept of how these different writers explain the spiritual life. John writes from his perspective, talks like Jesus. Then you have Peter, excuse me, Paul, who is the trained rabbi, the most, probably the most scholarly, the most educated, the most intelligent uh, philosopher, theologian, as it were, in the ancient world, from his training under Gamaliel, who was considered one of the greatest rabbis of all time, and from Paul's uh, use of language and development of difficult concepts, it's obvious that he is uh, much brighter than even the, a bright bulb that you may know in your life. Paul was amazing. Then you have Peter. Peter, who's writing in Greek, although his native language was probably Aramaic, but it's very possible because he's a commercial fisherman, he's in Galilee where there are a lot of Gentiles, he probably grew up uh, bilingual at least. He was comfortable in Greek, he was comfortable in Aramaic, he may have even had a rudimentary understanding of Latin, after all, there in the Roman Empire, so that is... Uh, you don't have to be educated in order to be bilingual or trilingual because there are a lot of people who are uneducated, can't read or write in the languages they speak, but because of the area where they grow up, they're exposed to two or three different languages and they just learn how to speak in all of those languages and how to understand them as they grow up. And th I, I think that's true. So many people have said, well, he's an uneducated fisherman. Well, there's a lot of uneducated people who can speak three or four languages, and there's a lot of educated people that can't speak English yet. And they were born in America. You know, like, like Churchill once commented that the, only, uh, that the English peoples in America and Britain are separated by a common language. <laughs> so let's just look at this concept of fruit. I pulled these passages together to make a point that in each of these passages that we're going to look at, there is an emphasis on the fruit, on the production in the believer's life. But there's different commands. My point is that these commands all must be somewhat synonymous because they all present necessary conditions for producing fruit. They're not mutually exclusive. They're all looking at the same idea, but they're expressing it in slightly different language. In John 15, Jesus' command to his disciples is for them to abide in him. That is the necessary condition for fruit bearing in John 15, 4. Abide in me, that's the command, and I in you. See, this is talking about fellowship not belief, they're already believers. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, so he's talking about fruit bearing, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, neither can you what? Neither can you bear fruit of yourself unless you abide in me. So abiding in Christ is the necessary condition according to Jesus in John 15, for producing fruit. Abide in him, you'll bear fruit. If we don't abide in him, we won't produce fruit. Then you have another phrase that's a little more common. That's the idea that we walk in light. Remember what I taught on Sunday morning. There's positional truth, which has to do with our identification with Christ, who we are in Christ, in the body of Christ. That is our position and then there is our experience, which is expressed by the word walking, our lifestyle, what we, 
what we do, how we think, how we act. We are to walk in the light, according to Ephesians 5.8. In the verse that precedes uh, Ephesians 5.8, it, it says that, um, uh, well, in, in 5.8 it says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So that's our position. You are light in the Lord. And then the next line is walk as children of light. So that's the command. That's the experiential command. Walk, uh, uh, walk, in, um, walk as children of light. Now, the result of walking as children of light in Ephesians 5 is seen in Ephesians 5, 9. For then the King James translation uh, translates it uh, for the fruit of the Spirit, I think the New American Standard, NIV, others translate it as either, the, I can't remember, it's either the fruit of righteousness or the fruit of truth. There's a textual problem there. I think it's probably the fruit of the Spirit uh, because of my view of how to handle t these textual variants. So I always go with this translation. It, it is parallel to Galatians 5.22, which is the passage in the third column. For the fruit of the Spirit, we get that because we follow the command to walk in the light. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So that's parallel to the, it has one common term, goodness, with 522, but it's, you see that it fits together. Then you see another passage, which is a fun passage, in Philippians 1.11, and the command in the previous verse, which is Philippians 1.10, says that you may approve the things that are excellent. Not a difficult concept to understand. The biggest decisions you and I make usually are not the decisions between something that is good and something that is bad. It is between something that is good and something that is excellent. And we are to pursue excellence. So we are to approve the things that are excellent. And then it says that you may be sincere, which is a terrible, terrible translation. There are a lot of people in this world who are very sincere about their beliefs about God, but they're going to be sincerely wrong at either the judgment seat of Christ or at the great white throne judgment. The word that is translated sincere is the word elikrineth. Now this is a interesting word, and I had not noticed this before in this particular word, come across this information, but that first part of the word, elikrines, is from the Greek word hele, which refers to the sun or sunlight. So this isn't the idea of sincerity, it's the idea of purity in light. So the first part has the idea of sunlight, the second, crino, has the idea of something that is examined in the light. So the word came to understand this idea of something that was pure, that was not tainted by sin, something that was walking in the light, the kind of language we have in Ephesians 5.8 or 1 John 1.7. So the result of being sincere or being pure would probably be the best way of being spiritually pure because you've been cleansed of sin is that you are then uh, filled, you have been filled with the fruits of righteousness. We'll look at the grammar and everything on that when we go through it. You're filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So Christ produces, along with the Holy Spirit, produces this this fruit in us. Then the next passage is Galatians 5.22. And Galatians 5.22 follows the command in, in Galatians 5.16, be filled by means of the Spirit, excuse me, walk by means of the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, we walk by the Spirit, and the result of walking by the Spirit like the result of walking in the light or abiding in Christ, is that the Spirit produces fruit in our life. 
character transformation. So the point that I'm making is all three of these different commands are, are necessary and they all produce fruit. So these three commands are roughly talking about the same thing, that dynamic, personal partnership with God in your spiritual life. That's what fellowship is. It's not static, it's active. It's a personal partnership. Walking by the Spirit is that partnership, walking in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Walking in the light, that's in the light of God's Word. Abiding in Christ, that is maintaining that close relationship, walking with our Lord. So that's the overview here. Now we're going to look at the details that we have here. This is a big problem. When you start talking about fruit, there are a lot of people who abuse passages that a tree is known by its fruit. You can't ignore the context. Jesus is talking about the fact that the, the results, the production of the Pharisees was divisive, it was legalistic, it enslaved people, they were under the heavy yoke of bondage to the law, and so the fruit exposed the fact that this was not from God. Fruit isn't so much overt, quantifiable activity, such as how many people are in your church, how much money you bring in, how many people you have won to the Lord, how many people you've witnessed to. It is internal character transformation becoming more and more like Christ. The second question is, how is this fruit produced? Is this a direct goal of the branch, that is the branch in the illustration of the vine in John 15, or is it the indirect and unavoidable consequence of abiding in Christ? Okay, one is produced by works, one is produced by, uh, by following the mandate just to abide in Christ, and he will produce the fruit in our life. So when we come to looking at John 15, I want you to turn in your Bibles to John 15. We'll start there. And we'll work our way through each of these key passages. We're not going to do a granular study, but we're going to just put everything together so we understand it a little more clearly. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So Jesus is the vine. The vine is the conduit through which the nutrients go into the, and develop the fruit. So the fruit has to have an intimate relationship with the vine. That is what Jesus means by the phrase, in me. Now, use a similar phrase, or, or, or a similar phrase was used by the Apostle Paul in his writings, in Christ. In Christ was talking about positional truth. In me is talking about our spiritual walk with the Lord. Jesus uses this phrase in me several times in the upper room discourse in relation to, uh, in describing his relationship with the Father. And that shows that it's a relationship term, not a positional term. Jesus doesn't have a positional relationship with the Father because he's not, he's not a sinner. He has always had this intimate relationship with the Father. So he is in the Father, and the Father is in me, he says. The second term is that word abide. Now, Calvinists of the lordship stripe, now there are some Calvinists like Louis Spirit Chafer who did not believe in the, really the Synod of Dort's understanding of perseverance of the saints. If you read in his systematic theology, he, he explains that more as the perseverance of the Savior in keeping us not in the perseverance of the individual believer to demonstrate that they're truly saved. That if you don't persevere, well then, you weren't truly saved. And the term that is used to describe that today is lordship salvation because they often use the term uh, fully accepting the lordship, the authority of Christ in your life. You have to accept that when you trust in Jesus or you really weren't saved. And they will often translate faith as commit. 
Faith never means commit. Pistis never means commit. It means to believe something, to trust in something. It doesn't mean to commit to something. So abide is a different word. Abide is a word that has to do with relationships. And as Jesus is talking to his disciples in John 15, he says, you need to abide in me. You need to continue in dependence upon me. And then there's a Greek word, iro, that is up there on the screen. And this is the one that people have trouble with. And you see it in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And oh, but the Arminians love that verse. Because that means that if you don't abide, Jesus is going to take away your salvation. But the word iro has another meaning that is just as common in the Gospel of John as the word, uh, as, as the idea of taking something away. It has the idea of lifting something up. And if you translate it, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, it makes better sense viticulturally. See, he's talking about how a gardener is going to prune and fertilize the vine so that it produces more fruit. He's not talking about disciplining or chastening or destroying the, uh, the, the fruit. So we'll get to that as we go through this. So in John 15, 2, Jesus says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's that word, Iro. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. So taking away, Iro is really lifting it up. That's a different concept from pruning. Pruning is getting rid of the distractions that are sucking nutrients away from the fruit production. If you have ever grown tomatoes, I didn't learn this uh, initially for a while, but a tomato vine in some ways is a lot like a grapevine, and that tomato plant will produce off of the main stem, it will produce what are called suckers. They don't produce fruit, they produce a lot of greenery, and if you don't prune those off of the plant, then it pulls the fruit production nutrition from the stem, and it doesn't go into the tomato fruit, it goes into producing nice, luxuriant green leaves. And one year I had these beautiful six-foot-tall tomato plants that were about this big around, and I had lots of green leaves and I had no fruit. That's when someone told me about the fact that I needed to be pruning these little sucker branches off. Well, that was the same idea in the ancient world and how they pruned the vines in the vineyard. The idea of taking away is, according to the Greek lexicon, according to Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, the first meaning is to lift up, take up, or to pick up. And so... That makes more sense viticulturally. Now, there was a man who went through Dallas Seminary a few years after I did who wrote a couple, a couple of good books on this subject. He wrote an excellent, outstanding article that was published in BIPSAC that helped the rest of us because he had his master's degree from this little agricultural school up Highway 6, Texas Agricultural and Mechanical School, for those who aren't from Texas. Um, and he had a major in viticulture. As it, at, back in the 70s, the Texas wine industry was just trying to get started. And so that was his idea. And so he did a lot of research on the viticultural practices in the ancient world and discovered that what they would do is when you, the vines were growing, at the end of the first year of production, if there were branches that didn't produce much fruit, then they would be lifted up, they would be tied up so there would be more air circulation, and they could get more sunlight so that the next year they would be able to produce more fruit. So it's not the idea of taking away in the sense of loss of 
Salvation, it is taking away in the sense of lifting up so that there's more air and sunlight. And he writes, thus there are two kinds of main branches. The shoot which comes out of the hard timber, that's the main stem, and promises wood for the next year, it's called a leafy shoot, or else when it is above the scar caused by tying the branch to the trellis, a fruit-bearing shoot. Whereas the other kind of shoot that springs from a year old branch is always a fruit bearer. So this is the first year doesn't produce fruit, ties it up, the next year produces fruit. Jesus says, verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. So it bears fruit at the end of the season. He prunes it back, gets rid of the suckers and everything so that there can be more uh, fruit-producing branches develop, and so it will bear more fruit. Notice the qualifiers on fruit. There's more fruit, much fruit, and much more fruit. So there are different stages of production in the believer's life. And then he says in John 15, 3, you, who's he talking to? The 11 disciples. He's already removed Judas. So everyone there is a believer. Judas was not a believer. And he says, you are already clean. Now, he had used that same phrase when he had talked to, uh, talked to Peter when he washed his, when Peter wouldn't want, let him wash his feet. And he, Peter said, well, well, give me a bath. Wash me all over. And Jesus said, you are all already clean, talking about the disciples. Judas is already gone. You've all, you're all already clean. And so except one of you, and that was to describe Judas. He said, and so here he is saying, you are already clean, all of you, because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word there is the gospel. They have believed the gospel. Now, here's a quote from Pliny, first century writer, Jewish writer. says, there's also left underneath the crossbar of a shoot called the keeper. This is a young branch not longer than three buds, which will provide wood next year if the vine's luxurious growth has used itself up. And another shoot next to it, the size of a wart called the pilferer, is also left in case the keeper shoot should fail. This is just talking about the pruning process. So that was was necessary. Then we have, and I lost the font on this uh, slide, the minnow is the verb here. It is the word abide, and it can put, mean living with someone. It means to put up with something or tolerating somebody. You, we often use that in English. I just can't abide what you did. I can't put up with it. To, to wait patiently for something. Uh, to be in a store or a wait. In intransitive sense, it means to remain in a place. That's the idea here, to remain in fellowship with Christ. It's not about how many times I can get back in fellowship. It's about how long I can stay in fellowship, walking by the Spirit, enjoying that partnership with God, actively walking with Him. It's not about going in and out, in and out. But if you're a baby, you're going to go in and out and in and out a lot just because that's a characteristic of a baby. But as you grow older, that should not characterize your spiritual life as much. Okay, let's... Look a little bit more at Ephesians 5, I mean, uh, uh, John 15. Verse 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you. See, that's that mutual dependence. Uh, we're depending on Christ. Christ is living his life out in us. Okay, so we abide in him. He abides that ongoing fellowship, partnership in us. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit in yourself unless you abide in me. So if we're not abiding in Christ, that's the same as walking by the Spirit, there's no fruit production. That's why I say abiding in Christ is the necessary, necessary element to produce fruit in John 15. But when we go to... The next passage in Ephesians 5, 8, and 9, the necessary element is walking in the light. So if walking in the light is considered the necessary 
element for producing fruit in Ephesians 5, abiding in Christ is a necessary element in John 15, then walk, abiding in Christ and walking in the life must be talking about the same thing. Okay, remember Jesus is the light of the world. So when we're walking in the light, we're walking in the light of Christ, the light of the world. In verse 5 of John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do a little bit. Didn't say that. You can do nothing. So this is a necessary qualification for producing fruit. And then in verse 6, Jesus says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. This is divine discipline. It's not the loss of salvation. He's going to be uh, pruned, and then the illustration comes, what happens out in the field is they're gathered up and they're burned. That's not talking about the lake of fire. That's just talking about the, the sin unto death. They're just taken out because they're a non-productive, non-productive branch. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. The re you'll ask what you desire, but what you desire is determined by the fact that you are abiding in him and you're asking for the right things. You're not asking for the things that are, um, that are shaped by your own sin nature and your own desires. And then in verse 8, he says, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Not so you will be saved. A disciple is not someone who's saved. It's someone who's saved and is growing and learning and is being taught the Word of God. So we'll come back next time and look at the other three passages, Ephesians 5.8. 9, 5, 8, 9, Galatians 5, 16, and 17, and uh, 20 and following, and then the Philippians 1, 1 passage. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening and pray that we might be challenged to really be more conscientious of our walk with you, that, that fellowship, that partnership in our spiritual life where we abide in you and you abide in us, where we walk by the Spirit, we walk in the light, and as we do this, you produce fruit in our lives. It's not something we can manufacture on our own. It is totally manufactured by you. And we pray that you'll help us to understand this and focus on it. In Christ's name, amen.